buckle up because today we're diving into Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching. Yes, a book that's been, well, blowing minds for centuries. It really is incredible. And you might be surprised how relevant this ancient text can be to your life today. Thousands of years later, Lao Tzu's insights on leadership, personal growth, even just navigating our crazy modern world, mm -hmm. they still resonate. Seriously. I mean, we're talking like fortune cookie wisdom, but like the deluxe ancient philosopher version. I like that, yeah. And we're distilling it all down into hopefully actionable insights just for you. Absolutely, yeah. So let's jump right into one of, I think, one of the biggest paradoxes in the Tao Te Ching, the idea of power. It's interesting. Yeah, you'd think an ancient text on leadership would be all about like bold action. Right. But Lao Tzu flips the script. He suggests that real power, true power, often lies in what we don't do. Okay, that's a little mind bending. So it's not about being the loudest person in the room or always striving for more control. Not quite. Lao Tzu uses this image of a wheel or a vessel in chapter 11. Okay. And he points out that it's the empty space. It's the void that actually makes them useful. Huh. Without that emptiness, they'd be useless chunks of wood or clay. Wow. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. So it's like saying it's not about cramming every second of your day with tasks. Sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is create space. Right. Precisely. And this idea of unconventional power, it comes up again and again. Chapter 66, for example, it highlights leaders who achieve greatness by placing themselves below others. Yeah. You know, it's funny. In our hyper competitive world, our instinct is to think, to be powerful, I need to be seen as powerful. Yes. But Lao Tzu is suggesting almost the opposite. Exactly. Think about the metaphor he uses in chapter 78, water. Okay. Water is soft, yielding, and yet over time, it can carve through rock. Mm. It doesn't fight to overcome obstacles. Right. It adapts. It persists. It finds a way around. That's its power. It's about influence, not just authority. Okay, but how does this ancient wisdom about power actually play out in the real world? I mean, can you imagine a CEO today saying, my leadership style, I'm like, a humble vessel. Laugh to speak. <laughs> Maybe not in those exact words. Right. But think about it. The most effective leaders often empower their teams. They listen more than they speak. And they aren't afraid to show vulnerability. Uh. They embody aspects of this, mm. this leading from behind concept, even if they don't realize it. That's a really interesting point. So it, it's about shifting our understanding of what it means to be powerful, maybe. It's not about ego or dominance, but about creating space for others to thrive. Exactly. And that requires a certain amount of inner strength, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And you know what? That actually leads perfectly into the next big theme we wanted to unpack from the Tao Te Ching, cultivating that inner strength. It seems like Lao Tzu is all about self-knowledge, humility. Yes. And it's fascinating how many verses emphasize this inner work. Yeah. Like chapter 33, which simply states, he who overcomes himself is mighty. Okay. But what does overcoming yourself even look like in our busy, always on world? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? For me, it comes down to mastering our impulses, our desires, that inner voice that's always pushing us to do more, be more. Oh, I know that voice. Chapter 48 talks about diminishing doing and embracing stillness. It's like quieting that inner chatter, that feeling of never doing enough. You know, I really struggle with that. I'm such a planner. Yeah. Always making lists, setting goals. Sometimes I just need to chill. And that's exactly what Lao Tzu is urging us to do. He's saying, hey, there's strength in stillness, too. Oh, okay. Chapter 26, he beautifully describes it. Gravity is the root of lightness. Stillness, the ruler of movement. I see what you mean. It's like you need that strong foundation, that inner stability in order to move through the world with grace and ease. And that actually resonates a lot with me right now. I'm realizing that my most productive days are often the ones where I start with a few moments of quiet reflection, just centering myself before diving into work. It's like that saying, sometimes we need to like schedule in unscheduled time just to be present with ourselves. Totally. It's not lazy. It's strategic. Yeah. Um... But okay, so we've talked about cultivating inner strength, but then there's that whole other challenge, right? Dealing with the world, like out there. It's like Lao Tzu wrote the original self-help book for a chaotic world, which let's be real, ancient China was too. Right. Wars, power struggles. I mean, the dude knew conflict, and yet he keeps pointing us back to nature for guidance. We talked about the water metaphor, which still kind of blows my mind, but there are so many other, like, nature-inspired gems in here. Didn't he compare governing to gardening at some point? He did, chapter 3. <laughs> Lao Tzu talks about how a wise leader should aim to govern 
by emptying minds, filling bellies, and strengthening bones. Okay, at first glance, that sounds like something you'd see on a wellness influencer's Instagram. Not an ancient text. Right. Yeah. But think about it. Emptying minds, that's about creating a sense of peace and clarity for people, right? Not overwhelming them with anxieties or desires, but giving them the mental space to thrive. Like creating the conditions for inner peace so people aren't just surviving, but actually able to like think clearly and contribute to society. Exactly. And then filling bellies is pretty straightforward, making sure basic needs are met, food security, shelter, that kind of thing. But I'm guessing it's not just about like physical needs, right? Yeah. It's also about a sense of safety and stability. You got it. When people feel secure, they're more likely to be generous and cooperative, which contributes to a flourishing society. And finally, strengthening bones. That's about building resilience, both individually and collectively, giving people the inner resources to face challenges head on. It's fascinating how he connects those things. Inner peace allows for clear thinking, feeling secure, allows for generosity, resilience allows for growth. It's like a whole system. It is. It's like he's mapped out the conditions for a thriving society. Mm -hmm. And you see this idea pop up again in Chapter 57, where Lao Tzu gets pretty blunt about the dangers of, like, excessive governing. Oh, yeah. What does he say? He literally says, the multiplication of prohibitive enactments increases the poverty of the people. Essentially, he's saying that too many rules and regulations can stifle innovation and create more problems than they solve. That's a pretty radical idea for any time period, let alone ancient China. It really is. He goes even further, saying the more you try to control people, the more they'll find ways to circumvent the system. It's like he anticipated the law of unintended consequences. Wow. Okay, so if too much control is the problem, what does Lao Tzu suggest instead? He contrasts this with the approach of the sage, the wise leader. He says the sage will do nothing of purpose and the people will be transformed of themselves. He'll take no trouble about it and the people will of themselves become rich. There's that paradox again. It's about leading without forcing, guiding without controlling, empowering people to find their own way. You've got it. And this concept of letting go of control, of trusting the natural order to kind of do its thing, that's a big theme in Taoism. I can see how that's a really powerful concept. But to be honest, as someone who likes to, you know, plan things out, it also makes me a little nervous. I hear you. Surrendering that control can be scary. But there's also a kind of freedom in it, you know? When we release that tight grip, we open ourselves to new possibilities. And we might just find that things unfold in a way that's even better than we could have planned. It's about trusting the process, even when it feels messy or unpredictable. Exactly. It's about realizing that we're not always in control. And that's okay. In fact, it might just be the key to unlocking our greatest potential. You know, one thing that really strikes me about Lao Tzu is how comfortable he is with the paradox. It's like he doesn't shy away from it at all. In fact, he seems to embrace it. He absolutely does. Yeah. Like in Chapter 41, where he talks about how people react to the Tao, the way. Okay. He says, scholars of the highest class put it into practice. Those in the middle waver back and forth, and those of the lowest class laugh. Then he says... If it were not thus laughed at, it would not be fit to be the Tao. So he's saying that if his teachings seemed perfectly clear and straightforward, they probably wouldn't be that profound. Exactly. The Tao, by its very nature, is elusive. It's full of paradoxes. It can't be pinned down or easily defined. And I think that's part of what makes it so intriguing. It's like he's inviting us to lean into the mystery, to be okay with not having all the answers. Precisely. And that can be a really challenging concept for many of us. We're so used to wanting clear-cut solutions, concrete answers. But Lao Tzu is asking us to let go of that need for certainty and to embrace the unknown. Which is kind of terrifying, but also kind of exciting when you think about it. It's like saying, hey, what if we just surrendered to the mystery of it all? Exactly. And when we do that, when we let go of our need to control and to figure everything out, we open ourselves up to a whole world of possibilities. We become more adaptable, more resilient, more able to navigate the ups and downs of life with a sense of grace and ease. I love that. It's about finding that sweet spot between effort and surrender, between action and non-action. You got it. And that, my friend, is the essence of the Tao. You know, it's interesting. We've been talking about like finding that balance, that sweet spot, yeah. but for all its emphasis on stillness and going with the flow, the Tao Te Ching also has a lot to say about leadership, doesn't it? It does, but it approaches leadership from a completely different angle than we might expect. 
Right. You know, Lao Tzu wasn't interested in dominance or control. He was more about wisdom, compassion, service qualities that, you know, aren't usually celebrated in a go-getter kind of leader. Right. So what does Taoist leadership actually look like in action? How would you even begin to put it into practice? Well, let's look at chapter 66. Lao Tzu says, Thus it is that a great state, by condescending to small states, gains them for itself, and that small states, by abasing themselves to a great state, win it over to them. Okay, I'm going to be honest. That one sounds a little cryptic to me. Can you, can you break it down? Absolutely. What he's essentially saying is that true leadership isn't about power or dominance. It's about service. It's about empowering others, not lording over them. So leading by example by putting the needs of others before your own. Exactly. And that can be a really hard concept to wrap our heads around, especially in a culture that often equates leadership with, you know, being in charge, being the one with all the answers. It's true. We tend to think of leadership as this very, like, top-down structure, the boss at the top, everyone else below. But what I'm hearing from Lao Tzu and from you is that real leadership is more about collaboration. Yes. It's about recognizing that we're all in this together that the most effective leaders are often the ones who are willing to step back, to empower others, to listen more than they speak. It's about creating the conditions for everyone to thrive, not just those at the top. Exactly. It's about recognizing the interconnectedness of all things. Mm. And that's a really radical idea, even today. It is radical, but it's also incredibly inspiring. It makes me think about the kind of world we could create if we all approach leadership from that perspective. It's a beautiful vision, isn't it? It's a world where leadership is not about power or control, but about wisdom, compassion, and service. It feels especially relevant right now with all the you know complex challenges we're facing in the world today, climate change, political polarization, social injustice. These are huge systemic issues that can feel really overwhelming at times. They absolutely are. Yeah. And while Lao Tzu may not have had you know all the answers to these specific modern day problems, I do think his teachings offer a powerful framework for approaching them. Okay. I'm really curious to unpack that a bit. What would it look like to tackle these complex challenges through like a Taoist lens? Well, for one, it would require us to shift our focus from, you know, individual gain to collective well-being, to recognize that we're all interconnected and that what impacts one of us ultimately impacts us all. So it's about moving away from that, like me versus us mentality and embracing a more collaborative approach. Exactly. And it's about approaching these challenges with humility, recognizing that we don't have all the answers, that sometimes the wisest course of action is to listen, to learn, and to be willing to change our perspective. That can be really challenging, especially in a world that often values, you know, quick fixes and easy answers. But it sounds like what you're suggesting is that real lasting change requires a much deeper, more nuanced approach. Precisely. It requires us to look inward, to examine our own biases and assumptions, and to be willing to do the inner work that's necessary to create a more just and sustainable world. It's about recognizing that we can't change the world until we first change ourselves. You got it. And that brings us back to that idea of cultivating inner strength. It's about finding that place of stillness and clarity within ourselves so that we can act in the world from a place of wisdom and compassion rather than from a place of fear or reactivity. And that feels really empowering. It's a reminder that we're not powerless in the face of these challenges, that each of us has a role to play in creating a better world. Yes. And it starts with the small things. It starts with being more mindful of our consumption habits, with treating others with kindness and respect, with speaking up for what we believe in, even when it's difficult. It's about living the change we want to see in the world, right? It's about aligning our actions with our values, even in like small everyday ways. Exactly. And those small acts of courage, of compassion, of living in alignment with the Tao, they have a ripple effect. They create a positive feedback loop that can ultimately lead to profound change. So even if it feels like we're just one person in a sea of billions, our actions really do matter. They absolutely do. And I think Lao Tzu would agree. Remember what he said in chapter 54? Tao, when nursed within oneself, his vigor will make true. And where the family it rules, what riches will accrue. The neighborhood where it prevails will thrive and more abound. And when it's seen throughout the state, good fortune will be found. Employ it in the kingdom more, and men thrive all around. Wow. So to sum it up, Lao Tzu is saying that by cultivating the Tao within ourselves and by living in accordance with its principles, we can create positive change that ripples outward, impacting our families, our communities, even the world at large. Exactly. 
It's uh. a powerful reminder that we're all connected and that even small acts of kindness and compassion can make a big difference. Well, that's certainly given me a lot to think about. As we wrap up our deep dive into the Tao Ching, is there one final takeaway you'd like to leave our listeners with? You know, I think the biggest takeaway is simply this. The wisdom of Lao Tzu is timeless. His words were written thousands of years ago, and yet they still hold so much relevance for our lives today. They offer us guidance on everything from leadership and personal growth to navigating a complex and ever-changing world. It's really quite amazing when you think about it. It really is. And if there's one thing I hope our listeners will do after listening to this episode is to pick up a copy of the Tao Te Ching and explore it for themselves. There's so much wisdom to be found in its pages, and I guarantee you'll come away from it with new insights and perspectives that you can apply to your own life. Couldn't have said it better myself. This has been an amazing deep dive. Thanks for joining me. The pleasure was all mine. And to our listeners, until next time, may you find harmony and balance on your own journey. And may the Tao be with you.